What's up, gents? How's it going? Should we say, uh, should we talk like uh, Jocko and start with good evening? <laughs> Take ourselves way too seriously. Good evening. Good evening. I, I think, I think him and his co host kind of see that as a joke. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> we, uh, we were talking to the green rooms. So, uh, Father Nix is in Florida. He's, uh, what, uh, Pope Francis sent you down there with an Anglican cleric, and you guys are going in twos, right? <laughs> going, to, going to work on ecumenism, I think, right? Did you just come up with that right there? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, well, I see I see all sorts of fun things going on in Rome. Justin Welby's there, and him and Francis are sending Anglican and uh, Catholic heirs out to go and bring christian unity to the world so i thought maybe that's why you were down there but who's uh, my, yeah who'd be my pair on this we could send uh uh i'm calvin I'm, robinson I got, with you yeah i was gonna say calvin robinson we could we could hook you up with calvin robinson <laughs> i like that guy we text um well he's catholic now i started listening yeah. to him i started listening to that on your guys show and uh it looks like you guys touched a couple uh controversial topics like i tuned in right when you guys were talking medjugorje which i'm not proposing we discuss tonight <laughs> but I, I was like right when i tuned in and i was like oh this is gonna be interesting in the live chat i didn't have time to finish it but well the thing is if, like people think i like i like i somebody accused me of being like a medjugorje promoters the other day and i'm like i don't ever i i, I have <laughs> all i've said is my parents went there in the 90s and it's like yeah but, i mean my parents went there that's all i know my dad had a convert and if anything i've used it to caution people against spiritual high experiences because my father no longer goes to mass so my father had a conversion there and he came back mm. there in the charismatic movement and he's going to all these things with the church and he's playing music and had like a lot of spiritual highs but when those valleys come because you're ch it's basically you're you're chasing the next spiritual high constantly and when you don't get it it kind of leaves you in the gutter you know so sure. I've, I've used it as a cautionary tale of anything that's good i mean i don't think it's real but i can't deny how many confessions are heard every year there? How many hours of adoration every day? Bishop I got bigger. There. I got bigger fish to fry. I mean, I'm 99% sure it's false, but in that 1% chance I'm wrong, I don't really want to answer to God and Our Lady for blaspheming. No. Uh, so that's why I just kind of leave it alone. Yeah, I've never been there, so I can't. I can't form my own opinion. I can only, you know. That's, that's Here's what I, I do to people. I say when they say they're going, I mean. Obviously, Mary said some, or I mean, whoever they claim is the Our Lady. Obviously, said some things that smack of religious indifferentism, like the holiest person in the town is a Muslim. Mary would never say that because maybe the nicest yeah. person in town is Muslim, but right. you can't. You, without baptism, you actually can't be holy, right? So we know that Our Lady would never say that. Um, Nor would she intentionally confuse. That's right, and um, so. I just say to people without getting into it, when they say they're going there, I'm, I just say, why don't you go first to all the places that are approved like Fatima and Lourdes, yeah. Aparicida, um, what's the one in England? I just tried to get there. like Walsingham. Walsingham. I tried to get out there. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, one answer you can give to people that's pretty gentle is just make sure you go to Fatima or Lourdes before you even think about going to Medjugorje. Yeah. Yeah. Not to derail it into a Medjugorje conversation, but uh, okay. So. <laughs> Um, Rob, I'm curious right off the bat, initial thoughts. On, on I generally uh, love Russian cinema just in general because mm -hmm. I did take six years of, of the Russian language in high school and college. So I got pretty familiar with Russian cinema and just kind of the Russian mindset and personality. So, um, so it was really, uh, I was really used to that, which was great. Um, overall, I, uh, I liked it, and even though it was kind of in an orthodox setting, I didn't notice really anything that was contrary to the Catholic faith at all. And I thought it um, really concentrated on some 
on some really good subjects such as um, repentance and and forgiveness and um, asceticism and things like that. So overall, I really liked it. Did you like it better than Padre Pio? Yeah, I did actually. You did? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Paul, the next Rob. Yeah, I mean, well, Rob didn't, if I remember, Rob wasn't a huge fan of Padre Pio. Rob's like the Eeyore of our movie review. (laughs) <laughs> so, you're the eeyore of our movie review series no somebody wrote us an itunes review and called, he called me eeyore, eeyore. oh there you all go right. Yeah. all right i guess this one was okay <laughs> that's hilarious oh, man. Bernovich is a russian spy so well the, the thing is um I remember, I I remember like telling Rob to watch this a while back. He goes, "Why would I watch a schismatic movie?" Oh, I, I was like... just in one of my argumentative, melancholic oh, moods okay. that I get with okay. you. Can I can I put? I'm just going to read what I put on Twitter because I saw that one Twitter handle kind of not exactly kind of attacked Anthony for this, and this is what I put on Twitter. I said Catholics have been discussing non-Catholic art since Acts 1723, so don't worry about the fact. It was made by non-Catholics. So was A Man for All Seasons yeah. about St. Thomas More. So I want to read real quick. This is from Acts 17. So Paul, he stands in the Areopagus in Athens, and he says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the Unknown God. Okay, that was written by a pagan uh, poet, and so he's discussing it. So I just want to make it, and I was actually coming up with all these reasons before this podcast started, why I believe the heresy of modernism, in other words, Catholic modernists are much worse than Eastern Orthodox. And then I thought, you know what? I don't have to go into why modernism is worse than Orthodoxy. All I have to say is Catholics can discuss art. Like, you know, Taylor Marshall and I had a group of people in France this summer. Imagine if we went to the Louvre and said, we're only going to go look at art that was made by Catholics. No, no, actually, we're just going to go look at art that was made by Catholics. We're pretty sure was in sanctifying grace. That's the only art we're going to look at. And when we look through the loop, you know, that's not how Catholics think we're, we're allowed. We might pick some secular movies in here and people are going to have to either deal with it or refrain from watching. I also would like to say, look, we're not going to tell you guys we're watching God's Not Dead. Like, this isn't a Protestant <laughs> movie, right? It's not like there's a. There's, oh, no, that's stuck, that song's stuck in my head now. <laughs> there's a big difference in Orthodox and Protestant, right? So, yeah. my, my views, especially under this pontificate about schism, uh, have kind of changed a little bit too. It's because when I look at the Eastern Orthodox, they 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 fully understand holiness. Like they understand holiness. They fully understand the idea of theosis in some ways more than Catholics. Many Catholics do where the whole point of what we're doing in this life is trying to be become like Christ. Like uh, we don't know what we will be, but we know we will be like him. I think it says in John or something, but Mm -hmm. they, they fully understand that holiness is us moving towards being more like christ they understand what the saints are they understand all that so and even our own church says their sacraments are valid they're you know things like that so i really do think it's okay to have a conversation about the orthodox in a very different way than we would if it was like just a general protestant thing i agree can i give you know i think i'm surprised how many catholics don't know the difference between eastern catholic and eastern orthodox can i give a quick explanation yeah please Okay, so Eastern Catholics live like the Orthodox, exactly like the Orthodox for the first thousand years of Christianity. And today it's the same, except for, like you mentioned, union with Rome. Um, Even though the Eastern Orthodox usually like to focus on the differences between them and the Eastern Catholics. But basically from the year 30 AD till what was it, 1054, 1055, um, all of the Catholics in Turkey and Egypt uh, would have identified as Orthodox and all well, the Orthodox would have identified as Catholic. Now there's debates on big O Orthodox versus little O Orthodox, and there's debates on big C Catholic versus little C Catholic. But, you know, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom um, in, say, modern day Turkey, if you're in the year 800, uh, we would have considered any saints coming out of Turkey in the ninth century to be Catholic. Now, any of the saints coming out of modern day Turkey in the ninth century, the Eastern Orthodox would have said, they were Eastern Orthodox. Okay, 
But whatever they were, and I think they were Catholics, um, whatever they were, they were doing the same thing. And then over the last millennium, some of the Orthodox have come back into union with Rome, and we call them Eastern Rite Catholics. Now, the, the negative name for them is Uniates. They don't really like that, that term. But it's interesting because most Catholics don't realize there are 23 Eastern Rites. And by right, I mean they have their own uh, style of sacraments. So we have one Western or Latin rite that probably 98% of your listeners are. In fact, 98% of the world of Catholics are. But that's only one of 24 rites, R-I-T-E-S. So 23 of the 24 rites in the world are Eastern rite. Only one is Western. And for a good chunk of those um, 23 Eastern rites, it's everything from like Assyrian Catholic to Greek Catholic to Russian Catholic. You have a mirrored Eastern Orthodox Church, and their sacraments are going to look very similar, but they're not going to consider themselves in union with Rome. Um, now, there's different debates among the Orthodox on should we even, like, in a, in, if we ever came back in union with Rome, would that be first among equals? Would Rome be first among equals? Those are a bunch of debates we don't want to get into tonight. But everyone from James Martin to Taylor Marshall to even set of a contest believe the Eastern Orthodox have valid sacraments that's mm. not even i mean everyone from far left to far right in the catholic church all agrees they have valid sacraments so yep. so that's where it's kind of weird that people are jumpy about it but in fact i don't even know if it was made by a practicing eastern orthodox this is a russian movie that he made actually to rip on monks and he didn't realize in making a holy fool he was making actually a saint very accurate according to the eastern the eastern understanding of a holy <laughs> fool so uh, the funny thing is we're not really discussing, I'm not even sure the maker was like super Eastern Orthodox, but the Orthodox did love it. And so did all of Russia. And it won all these awards in 2006. It's a great movie. I mean, it's in some ways he reminds me of Padre Pio. Like yes. Some of the things he does, he reminds me of Padre Pio, not just the miracle stuff, just like his quirkiness. You know, like the, there's a quirkiness to this guy that that it, it's it's very interesting. And I'm really interested to see uh, when we get to the scene I picked. I, I can't wait to hear your take on it because I, I got something. I got something for us. But we, we won't go to mine first. Mine's later on in the movie. But the liturgy scene when he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing in the liturgy. I'm excited to hear your take on that. And, and, yeah. and I want to get to that. But your scenes are definitely earlier in the movie. You picked the opening scene, yeah. right? I picked the opening scene. And this is why I put on Twitter yesterday, I told there's going to be some spoilers. People should watch it because what I'd like to do either before or after the opening scene, actually probably right before, uh, is explain what we're about to watch. Um, can we jump into that? Yeah, so before, before we do, like if anybody's watching that hasn't seen the movie though, like stick around. Because these these conversations, yeah, you can watch like, it later. Yeah, yeah, you can watch it later, and we're kind of giving you some of the highlights, but it's still worth watching later. And also, that's kind of like what we do with this show. So if you're just checking it out, what we do with this show is we pick the scene, we'll play it, so you guys will know exactly what we're talking about, and then we kind of play out to see how this could, you know, play out in modern times, like how it affects mm -hmm. us, how it affects our faith, our life, anything like that. So even if you've not watched the movie, stick around. I think you guys will enjoy it. Now, for those of you listening in, on audio, the the movie is in Russian, so sorry <laughs> yeah it's a, this yeah. is gonna be fun on audio unless you speak russian yeah maybe we'll give you guys the highlights you know we'll try to we'll yeah. try to keep in mind that there are people that listen on audio all right Can let's we go ready let's for the opening the, scene pick the opening scene yeah oh wait can I, pause for a second. I, I i actually do have a little preview before this so um for anyone who hasn't seen this movie yet this is um, 1944, way, way northeast Russia, and there's a skipper on the boat, and there's a captain on this boat. It's a communist boat. It's at the end of the war. The Nazis show up. They board the boat, and they're looking for the captain, and uh, they find this scraggly little guy who's later going to become the star of the movie, The Monk. You're going to see in this scene why he devotes himself to a life of penance. What what you're about to see is um, they ask him, and this is to this is this was common. Uh, I'm pretty sure what Nazis and the other communists would do to break down someone's morals so they would beat themselves up the rest of their lives. 
they would make one friend kill another one of their own friends under pressure. And um, when he does this, well, we'll explain how this leads into a life of penance. But I just wanted to give the historical back. And this is not a historical fiction movie, but not, uh, Nazis board a communist boat. They grab this scraggly little uh, boat worker by the ear and they make him uh, show where the captain of the communist boat is. Yeah, this this scene basically sets up the whole movie. So Yeah, that's why I picked it. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Go for it. Wie lange? 20 Minuten. Die sind wertlos. Er schießen. Anlegen. Sei ein Mann. Und du wirst leben. So he, he does that to save his own skin. Tiha. 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 Cut it there, right? No, oh, I yeah. want to. See, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. It's like they, you, you, you see the juxtaposition between, like uh, Paul said, it's like the perfect juxtaposition between how to how to be a man under stress and how not to. You see the one coward, mm -hmm. and you see the other guy just like lights up a cigarette. He's like, let's go. And, and one thing that's like. that we didn't really see, but that's important to note is that um, that uh, Anatoly, the who becomes the monk, he mm -hmm. is. Uh, a boiler man on the ship so he's constantly shoveling coal into the boiler and we'll see later oh, um as, as he's on the island as a monk he he's always shoveling coal into into the boiler that heats the monastery and he they even offer him um a way out of there because he's sick um but he says no he wants to he wants to stay there and, and i don't know what you guys but i saw it as him um doing it as a, like an act of of penance uh for what oh, happened for sure. on the ship yeah for yes. sure i totally missed that and i think probably most of your viewers know what happens next but um he thought he got away from it they they blow up the nazis blow up the communist boat and um he lands in the icy sludge at night and then monks drag drag him back to the monastery and that's the monastery he stays in for 60 years doing penance for shooting his captain yeah. And in doing this, he becomes a holy fool, which I'd like to define later. He basically becomes this annoying prophet in the monastery. But one reason he's blind to all of his miracles is because he's so haunted by the scene that we just saw. That's why I wanted to do the opening scene is because he's so haunted by the fact he murdered a man, shot a man. Um, 
he uh, God can use him for miracles because he doesn't have much of a chance of becoming prideful. Yeah, but it also it it's it's a great. Um, okay, so I think especially as modern Catholics, I can I, I'll speak from ex, from personal experience. Like I'm so confident in the sacrament of confession that when I go, I know my sins are are removed from me as far east as as far from me as east is from west, right? Yes. And the you know i'll do my penance that the priest gives me but it's like that you know i it's almost like i put it out of out of mind after i do it where i feel like the saints whenever you read any of them like you read saint mary magdalene did like seven years of penance and you, you, i mean people would do years of penance for a mortal sin and yeah. i think especially in in modern times we go and we say our three Hail Marys and that sin is just out of sight, out of mind. We don't even mm -hmm. think about it ever again. And we don't think of penance in the same way that I think they did in earlier times. That's right. You know, if you look, so in the old calendar, everyone's conglomerated into either like virgin martyr or, um, you know, martyr, not virgin or confessor saint, confessor, which means, yeah, yeah um, or, or Episcopal martyr or, you know, well, there's, there's actually a category called penitent and St. Mary Magdalene is that she can't be listed as a virgin and she didn't die as a martyr. So that's actually her official title. And so tradition understands, I'm just backing up what you said right there, Anthony, that, I mean, tradition holds that she lived her whole life in penance. In fact, even holds yeah, her, whole Peter, life, yeah. her whole life, her whole Yeah. St. Peter for denying Jesus chose to live a whole life of penance uh, for that act. And and I think the East has kept, I mean, I would say East and West in the first millennium of Christianity understood. But see, and it was not that you're saying it is, but penance wasn't so dark. It was sort of like a constant return to God. If you look at how East and West saints in the first thousand years of Christianity understood penance, it wasn't just shame and beating yourself up. It was, it was, you just, everyone, even those who had only committed venial sins in their life and not mortal sins understood you live a life of penance to detach yourself and it's this pilgrimage back to God who made you. Um, so it wasn't as dark and as guilt-ridden as maybe post-Protestant Catholicism has made it. Because it's like, you're right, if, if, you, if you were to say um, to a youth group after, like, let's say all these kids go to confession. Now make sure on top of the penance you did that you live the rest of your lives in penance. You just get fired as a youth minister. But if you said that in an Eastern Orthodox youth ministry, everyone would be like, yeah, that's yeah, that's how the saints live. We understand you, that. You you look at a guy like Saint Thomas More, right? The guy the guy wore hair shirts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Like like he wore a hair shirt. It's like the the idea that the 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 road to heaven in in um I think it was the one of the quotes from a man for all seasons. He was talking to uh, Wolsey, and he says the the you know we won't get to heaven on feathered pillows. Right. We'll, we'll get there on the cross. Like that the, yes. the path to heaven is not on a feather bed. It's on the cross, you know. So I, I feel like as modern Catholics, we've lost that understanding and these little penitential acts that we don't even do anymore. But but this guy was so affected by this one act that his whole life became a penitential act, and that it really is what allows him to be so open to and you'll see it in in the comparison between him and the prideful monk. So as we go yeah. through these scenes, you're gonna see the the difference. And, and oh man, I hope we picked one of the. Did, did, did you pick the scene where he asks the the prideful monk, uh, "Why did Cain kill Abel by any chance?" No, but I love that scene, and you know why he puts soot on that prideful monk's door handle, right? Yeah, it's to it's because he's so worried about his his appearance and 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 things like that. Well, and I think, I mean, he's also. No, I think he's struggling with uh, sins of, we'll say, impurity with yourself. Oh, Cause, okay. Because he says, because remember, he he puts soot on it for it to end up on his hand, dirt on yeah. his hand, and he goes, I know what my sins are. So I think it's more than just spiritual sins. Oh, oh wow. I didn't even pick up I on that. Have that. Yeah, he's he's telling him that he's uh, guilty of uh, self-abuse there. Know. I didn't even pick up on I, that. I, I have the whole video pulled up. I could find that scene. Uh, well, well, I want to well, make sure I want to make sure that we showcase the the prideful monk versus him because yeah, I, it, it's a it's a it's such an important aspect of the movie to see this 
this prideful monk who is doing everything by the book, just doing everything by the rules, following all the rules. Yeah. Um, but you know, An Anatoly has Anatoly or Anatoly has this Anatoly. deep Anatoly has like a deep insight into the man's soul and he's not doing it to mock him. He's doing it because he really cares for his soul and he's trying That's to right. help him. That's right. It's a, it's a, it's a strange thing where, where, where the other monk thinks he's doing it to mock him and tease him and stuff, but no, he's doing it because he loves him. And he knows if he does these things, he's going to, he's going to open an Avenue in his heart. And, and this is where I wrote a blog post on Holy fools. And I said, the best definition I've seen for a fool for Christ is one who feigns madness to mock the world. And see, that's different from just thinking someone's a clown for Christ. Mm -hmm. Listen to this again. One who feigns madness. That means he's not really crazy. A lot of times people think the holy fool is crazy, but we're not talking about your just, you know, uh, run of the mill schizophrenic on the streets. This is someone who's pretending to be mad, but it's actually revealing to the world, those who are addicted to the world, the flesh and the devil, that they're the insane ones. And that's how they're mocking the world. So yeah. fool for Christ doesn't mean just the schizophrenic guy at the soup kitchen who you think is holy. He actually might be really holy. I'm not saying schizophrenics at soup kitchens aren't holy. There might be some saints. But if they're actually struggling with mental illness, they're actually not a fool for Christ. Yeah. And, and that's, a, that's a misunderstanding people who first start studying this whole category of Eastern saint called fool for, or holy fools think it is. Um, yeah, they're and especially... They're messing okay. with you think you think you're messing with them, but they're actually messing with you. So this is why this ties into why he's revealing people's sins. Yeah, you, you got to understand, especially a, 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 in a time like we're in where the world is upside down. Like we, we live yeah. in an upside down world right now. Like a holy fool will reveal the absurdity of the world. Like so. you'll be embarrassed at this compliment, Anthony. But I mean, this when you and I were walking around New York City, I was I was really edified by your custody of the eyes because we're just getting warm out you know people had on on uh, finally had like shorts and yoga pants and everything and and you just you have such good custody of the eyes when we're out and about and sometimes the devil whispers in my ear well you're gonna be if you don't like kind of look at people and smile or whatever as a priest you're not going to be a good ambassador for christ well isn't it more important that i keep my own purity of eyes when i'm walking around and i saw that in you and this is the thing is even an act like that is a fool for christ why because if you're not looking around at everybody, it looks weird, but you're putting Christ ahead of looking normal. So even something as basic as walking around New York City with good cuss of the eyes makes you in a in a little way. It doesn't make you a yeah. full-blown fool for Christ. But do you see what I'm saying? That when yeah, you yeah. do things to honor Christ that look weird, we should still do it because there's a whole category of saints called holy fools for Christ. Yeah. Um, all right, so Rob, were you able to find that scene? Yep, I have it. Oh, look, let's let's watch it. All right, so this is this is what we were talking about for anybody that didn't see it. Does any Orthodox in the chat let us know? I want to. I want to know if there's any Orthodox checking the show out. Отец Анатолий. See that reminded me of Padre Pio. Like, it must be some mean souls. You know? <laughs> <laughs> 
Все мы боимся гиены огненной. Слушай, батюшка, отец его, благослови, я здесь останусь, я, я здесь привык, все знаю, да, а то вон зима, снег, и... топить же надо. Да, да слушай, что я тебе говорю-то? Да. Отец Филарет милость к тебе проявляет. Слушай, ты ведь грамоте учился? Кого бы не учился, начальником не поставили бы. И священные книги читал? Читал, даже много наизусть помню. А вот я забыл, за что Каин брата своего Авеля убил. Ты все шутки шутишь. Ты вон ручку лучше вытри. Спасибо, Господи. Mm -hmm. So he, he's asking, why did Cain kill Abel? And if you think back to the story of Cain and Abel, Cain is jealous of his brother because God accepts his sacrifice, right? Yes. So, and, and you see later on in the movie, the because I don't know if you picked the scene, but you see later on, he actually addresses it and he says, I wanted God to accept my sacrifice and make it so that I, I would be able to help people. And, I, and I've never been able to is because he struggles with pride. Yeah. And Self sufficiency. And, and because Antony or Anatoly is so emptied because of his humility at shooting that guy, God can use him. Yeah. Yeah. You, it's, oh, man. I, I loved seeing those two guys, the interaction, because I mean, we'll get to it later on. But the end of the movie, the, the way the, the prideful brother's heart is converted. Is, is mm -hmm. a really awesome scene, you know? So yeah, what's the next scene that you picked, Father? Uh, so this is pretty appropriate for this week <laughs> of human life. Well, half of our country's pro-life and half's anti-life. And um, so where we come in, this is the, uh, the uh, we have to be careful on triggering the uh, algorithms on YouTube. It's A-B-O-R-T-I-O-N. Um, and so this is that scene. And I think it was pretty common in the 80s in communism, you know, something like um, every Russian woman in the 1980s had two A-B-O-R-T-I-O-N-S on average. That's how, that's how devastating uh, it was. And so they had this weird superstition that you go to a monk or a priest for a blessing to get. Oh, your... wow. You're giving context here. I didn't know that. Yeah. And so and this, so that's where you see this scene. She's a 18, 19, 20 year old. And she kind of goes in just for this pro forma blessing before she goes to the OB doc. Right. And um, I assume maybe some bad priest just did it in the hopes that it, I don't know. Everyone can justify their sins. I'll give her a blessing in the hope that this makes repentance later. Hey, what does that sound like? Fiducia. Dude, it really like when I saw this scene, that's all I could think of. Right. When I watched the scene, all I could think of is the the modern issues we're dealing with in the church. And I was just like, this is how this should be handled. Totally. So, and I have yeah, a few let's, thoughts, at, but let's let's roll the uh, that scene. And I have a few thoughts on. Well, let me just say one of these thoughts before we watch it. So Old Testament prophets often act out their message to the people. Like, remember how Ezekiel um, is made to lay on his side for 400 days in reflection of the 400 days or 400 years of, um, I think it was Israel in the wilderness. Ezekiel has to lay on his side for 400 days. You often see prophets live out the very thing that is going to happen. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the scenes you picked, Anthony, with the fire, right? That yep. a prophet lives out what's going to happen. And so what you see here, it's part partly mockery to break her down, but it's partly this Old Testament sense of prophecy that you see in these Eastern holy fools for Christ. Yeah. What happened to Rob? <laughs> I'm here. Sorry, oh, oh. Okay. Rob. Okay, we ready that, for the scene? scene that I picked with the fire. I don't think I picked the. I didn't. I didn't go back far enough. So when we get to my scene, you're gonna have to back it up a little on your version. Okay. Because I want him. I want it from when he's up in the tower and he throws the log down. Okay. That's really well, where I want to start. We're doing from. father scene right now. We're doing right? fathers yeah, now. Please. Yeah. За благословением на убийство приехала. 
Вот тебе не благословение. Пожалуйста, батюшка миленький, спросите благословение на аборт у старца. В ад собралась. И меня с собой затащить хочешь. А? Не знаю, не знаю. Ежели я его покажу, меня никто замуж не возьмет. Кому я здесь чем-то нужна? А тебя и так никто не возьмет. На роду написано. Здесь ребеночек будет. Утешение. Всю жизнь себя проклинать будешь. Что дитя-то невинное убило. А вы-то откуда знаете? Вы же не старец. А может, я сам-то человека убил. Ну ладно, вставай с колен. На коленях Богу молиться надо, что передо мной -то стоять. Мальчик-то будет. Золотой. So that's what you mean by feigning craziness. Yeah, like he's, exactly. He's that. And, and the, the thing is, uh, one thing I definitely picked up on is, so you, uh, you want me to accompany you to hell. And it's like these priests yeah. that are playing with this stuff, with this blessing stuff, you are going to accompany these people to hell. That's right. And I mean, you know, if what was happening in the church five years ago, like, let's put it this way. Do I think there's people who go to the Novus Order who, who are going to go to heaven or on their way to heaven? Of course I do. But a priest who gives a blessing is going to go to hell. So now we actually have proof of apostasy in the Vatican that they are commanding priests to do something that will lead other people and themselves to hell. Uh, hope people have listened to Patrick Coffin on your guys' show. We won't go deep down that rabbit hole. But you see what I'm saying? That like now this isn't just a little inside baseball liturgical debate. If a priest does what was just commanded by the Vatican, they will go to hell. That's, that's different than a liturgical debate. So um, Christian Mario is our friend. And he said, this is real ecumenism. Watching Orthodox movies as a Catholic and Catholic movies as an Orthodox. Um, yeah, so uh, if you go back to the beginning of the show, we like I really, I, I'm, I've learned so much um, just from, because, I, and, and it could have been from an Eastern Catholic or an Eastern Orthodox, just that Eastern spirituality really has some some really deep insights into theosis and and things like that that I've I never really here in catholic circles that have really changed the way i even see certain things but i didn't pick up on the uh on the the, the making his belly bigger until you said that man like I, there's so many things you're pointing out that i didn't pick up on and see the eastern orthodox never had a vatican too so they keep looking i mean some traditional catholics criticize the eastern orthodox and say well their magister their magisterium is stuck in the sixth sixth century okay fair critique Ours, if you look at the Vatican, seems to be stuck in the 1960s. That's, yeah, that's the a moment. bigger problem. Yeah. <laughs> I think and, I'll make uh, the sixth century <laughs> over the 60s. Yeah, so I get, I mean, I, you know, I get why there's there's Catholics leaving, but they shouldn't. Um, and again, that part of that comes down to uh, Patrick Coffin's thesis right there. But I really believe, as you said, you know, when, like, I do think that Eastern Orthodox are very wrong on, the, on rejecting the filioque way. So we're not going to get into that. Um, that's the number one reason I think that Catholics shouldn't go Orthodox in this time of crisis is, yeah. I mean, yeah, we're not telling anybody that, to go Orthodox. No. We're just, but but they're... they do have a richness because they never had a Vatican too. They have a rich, I mean, all their sacraments go back to the sixth century at the latest, probably apostolic times. Mm -hmm. But I mean, imagine, look at that scene real quick. So when the, when the girl says, nobody will marry me with a child, Think of what your average neocon, non-trad um, uh, Catholic priest who just got out of seminary, he'd say, God has a great husband plan for you. 
Yeah. And Father Anatoly says, nobody's going to marry you anyway. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Nobody's so, going to marry you anyway. But then he, so he has, look at what happened in his life. He got broken down and then God uses him for miracles. He has to break her down before he prophesies this is going to be a golden boy, a beautiful boy. And, you know, he has to break her down to understand what this is going to do and really have a, a realistic vision of her life. Yeah, it's it's so I'm telling you so many things that I'm seeing. He he, he doesn't mince words. Mm -hmm. He's not afraid to say a hard truth, you know, because he said, I mean, he he was mean to her. It's, he's like, nobody's going to marry you anyway. Right. But it's but he's telling her the truth. And he's like, look, no one's going to marry you. At least this child will comfort you. You're, you're 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 going to be in the same boat either way but if you at least have the child you'll have this child to comfort you through your life you know as an orthodox of russian descent i'm very pleased with you guys exploring and discussing this film may you journey to christ bear, may your journey to christ bear, bear fruit yeah look there's like, it's a very different conversation that we're going to have with orthodox than we would with protestants right i, I really yeah. think i think that there's so much room for agreement between Catholic and Orthodox, it's just, it's sure. such a different conversation. You're, you're arguing over little minutia things instead of, instead of like the orth Protestants. It, it because, doesn't require having to change your whole world view. Yeah. Right. But where the Protestants have, a, once you have once saved, always saved in your head, the spiritual life can't mm. advance. That's a it great can't point. Advance because you just yeah. have this idea. Oh, once saved, always saved. There's no need to go deeper. It's yeah. It's a strange thing that that happens where it's, you know, your your spiritual life ends at that altar call. It's like, well, I gave my life. I got saved on this date. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Um, Protestants in the house. Go ahead and sum it over, please. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron's, Aaron's like a crypto Catholic, though. He'll be here soon. <laughs> There's no way. We're crypto well, you, settings. You know, He's a you crypto cat. <laughs> you see that even in the scene we just looked at, this whole one saved always thing is rejected by him because he scares her. That if you murder this child, it's going to haunt you the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, what did you pick? Any other scenes? Yeah. Can I give a real quick thought? As long as we're on the theology of this, um, something Father Isaac, our common friend, pointed out to me, and Father Kramer points this out too. You know, it's prophesied. If you look at the seven ages of the Church of Holzenhauser, it's prophesied, and many people think we're on the threshold of the fifth and the sixth age of the Church. Sixth age of the Church should be this era of peace. If we're not at the very, very, very end right now. There's many people that believe that in the sixth age of the church, we will get this pope who accurately consecrates Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And Father Isaac was telling me, Mary, and Father Isaac can text me if I get this wrong, but I think he told me that um, Mary herself said Russia would convert rapidly due to miracles. This is going to be a slow thing. When we actually have a traditional pope consecrate Russia, Russia will convert. They will become Eastern Catholics. They will have to renounce the filioque, of course, after all the all the tomfoolery in the Vatican right now, it would take like an Our Lady of Guadalupe sized miracle to convince the Russian Orthodox to actually become Eastern Catholics. And I get that the Orthodox think I should renounce my adherence to the filioque. I'm just going off Catholic prophecy that they will uh, renounce the rejection of, of filioque. But anyway, point is this, imagine we had a traditional Pope who abrogated Vatican II, returned the Catholic Church to all the old rite sacraments, the Eastern Orthodox, what would it take for them to do to accept a traditional pope that said, we're going back to all ancient sacraments? They would only have to come in union with that pope, pronounce the filioque and a couple other errors, and they would get to keep all of their patristic theology, all of their yeah. liturgy, all the divine liturgy, all the sacraments for how they do confession and everything else. It's gonna If this happens, and many good traditions believe it, it's going to be so much easier for the Eastern Orthodox to come into union with a traditional Pope who abrogates Vatican II than the 0 .8, 0 0.8 billion modernist Catholics out there. Well, I was just going to say, in some ways, I think guys like us have more in common with the Orthodox than we do with a lot of modern Catholics. Of course. You know, course. like modern Catholics are just, their minds are so twisted from bad theology over the past 70 years that i really do i do find more in common with guys that take their faith seriously that are eastern orthodox than i would with a lot of modernists yeah yeah even um, evangelicals believe that the bible's an error i mean you couldn't name one bishop in this country i bet who rejects evolution 
I bet not even Bishop Strickland. I bet you can't name one bishop in this country. And I can, there's tons of Eastern Orthodox and, and evangelical pastors that do. One of the one of the coolest things I've I've realized is all the Eastern Orthodox that I interact with are all anti-evolution. Like it's one one yeah. commonality that I have with them that it's it's very cool because I mean if you go back to the early church, there's none of the fathers even played with this idea of evolution, you know, they all so it's just we're gonna get uh, called the, we're gonna get called set of a contest and schismatic orthodox by the end of the time. I don't really care, man. <laughs> <laughs> Let them talk. You're never ever gonna please everybody. You can only be yourself. Oh, wait, one last thing on the abortion scene. Did I'm sure everyone caught this? I hate to point out the obvious, but did remember she said, How do you know? And he looks deep in her eyes and he says, Maybe it's because I'm a murderer myself. Yeah. yeah. Well, on top of that, if anybody it. didn't if anybody didn't see the movie, every person that comes to see Father Anatoly or Anatoly, he doesn't tell them he is Father Anatoly. He That's he right. pretends. Let me go get him. He doesn't ever. Heard there's this super holy monk on the island who works miracles, and they all look at him and say, "Can you go get him?" Because they don't think it's him. Yeah, he's this filthy, this filthy <laughs> bummer. He goes, yeah, 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 I'll go get him. And then, I'm going to leave the door open. You talk out here. You'll hear me yelling. And he's actually nuts. He goes and he talks here, and then he moves over here and responds to himself. It's pretty funny, man. That's a great – did you see the live chat, but we beat the Eastern Orthodox to the moon? That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> so I think my scene might be the next scene chronologically. Oh, Rob picked the scene. Oh, give me a break. Oh, man, you Come like on. this movie, dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the scene with the um, the boy that he heals. Great. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Great scene, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have to fight the copyright strike on this one, boy. <laughs> my my last two scenes are the last two scenes, so I think Anthony's comes before it. Yeah, the one the I have two scenes that I picked, and I and Great. they're both just so such powerful scenes to me. The 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 main one I picked first off the the scene I picked is like seven and a half minutes long. I wanted to make it twelve minutes long because it's <laughs> that whole sequence is just so powerful. But all right, let's Fire watch Rob's. Rob. Okay. So this is uh, basically right when he fish, finishes praying for the boy who has a, basically a, a broken leg that didn't heal right. Um, and we'll go from there. Вот, Ванюша. Теперь все будет хорошо. А теперь, а теперь давай попробуй косам, а? Ничего, Ну, мы, мы пойдем. Спасибо. Куда пойдем? Вам надо в монастыре остаться переночевать, потому что мы завтра с отцом филаретом мальчика твоего в храме причастим. Храмать больше не будет никогда. Я не могу остаться. Мне на работу надо. Да что я тут с вами? В игры играю. У меня билет на поезд. А тебе что же? Сын родной дороже? Да. Или работа? Мне на работу тоже надо. Уйди. Уйди ты за глаз моих. Уйди. 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 I love that he's fed up with her. Like, get out of mm -hmm. my sight. Yeah, I chose the scene because um, what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, the whole idea of like women working and, and largely feminism in general has marxist and communist origins like the soviet union made women work um and that's why she's so kind of set on having to go to work because she could lose her her you know state given job and and 
you know, state given not really money because they don't really give money in the communist nation. But anyway, so like the whole notion of feminism and women in the workforce, it all it's all communist. <laughs> all of it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and that's you, what, and that's you what Mary and Fatima meant by the errors of Russia. People yes. think of like that just meant concrete buildings or economic stuff, but it. Um, and uh, well, we should give a quick caveat. Like, obviously, there are women who have to work in the in the workplace if like their husband's paralyzed. But we're not we're not yeah. against it. Absolutely, every case. Well, right. right. It's not inherently but evil. It's not inherently, but that would be included in what was um, it, it is a generality. Of course, that's included with what Mary said. Errors of Russia. It's it's also you seeing she's putting work before her own child. It's like even if you did lose your job, you know, you talking about your son being like, how much do you how much do you love your son? You know, and this is the scene that most reminded me of Padre Pio for me because it's like God's going to work a miracle for you. God worked a miracle for you, and you can't thank Him. I mean, it's like the ingratitude really got the saints when they saw. Someone would receive a miracle and walk away without having time to pray. That really ground the gears of saints. And that's why I love I love this scene too, because you see it's not about him. It's about he sees God's heart is hurt by her ingratitude for the miracle. Yeah, you see that in, even in the Gospels when Jesus heals yes. the, the ten and only one comes back to thank him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the other nine just like go about their business. And he's like, only one of you came back to me? Or one at one of the twelve was even at the crucifixion. Yeah. Um, all right. So I think I think I think my scene's next, but I want to go back to where he throws the log, Rob. Oh, okay. I got to correct Sorry. something I said earlier. My conscience tagged me. I should be really clear. I don't know what Bishop Strickland um, thinks about evolution. I I hope. Yeah. No. You it. you were making I don't, a. I don't know, but I've never. I'll put it this way. I've never heard a U.S. bishop in all my. 10, 20, 30 years of looking at what bishops say. I've never heard a U.S. bishop speak against Darwinian evolution yeah. ever, ever. Yeah. Yes. I might be wrong, but I've never, life, I've never seen it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are we ready? Yeah. We got it all queued so, up for you. So what's going on here is just like with the, with the belly scene uh, that Father Nix was explaining, he's giving a prophecy as as the uh what would what uh, as the father superior or something I, what would you call him yeah the abbot in a sense right yeah abbot yeah they, they 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 use a weird translation in this movie you're talking about anatoly or you're talking about oh. philaret 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 yeah abbot i think abbots i mean that might be a western term but that's yeah that's so the abbot's thing, coming abbot. over and anatoly gives him like a premonition but he's and it's it's pretty pretty He's like, I know what you're doing. He goes, No, you don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> go ahead. Well, this is probably there. gonna be a long one, huh? Aunt? Uh, we could fast forward certain parts. I just want to show that little clip and then we could skip ahead to the liturgy scene. Oh, real quick. And so it says in Ezekiel chapter four, four to five, God says, then it says this to Ezekiel, then lie on your left side and put the sin of the house of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for 390 days, you will bear the sin of the house of Israel. So do you see how certain prophets are called to act out in their body in yeah. like a microcosm? What's about to happen in the macrocosm? So this is very yeah. biblical, the, the scene that you picked. Yeah, here we go. Ты что там делаешь? Тебя дожидаюсь. А почему ты в меня головной кидаешься? Ну, случайно. Из рук вырвалось, смотрю. А тут ты идешь. Ну, понятно. Ничего тебе не понятно. No, you don't. Come down. He goes, I see. No, you don't. На тебя пошли жалобы. Yeah, leave it first. И крепцы взыскаша душу мою. И что же мне прикажешь делать с тобой, проказник? Дивны дела твои, Господи. А ведь говорят, ты разводишь суеверия и соблазняешь братью и народ. Избави меня от клеветы человеческие. Да ты не избавляйся, рассуди, брат. Мне ведь как начальнику твоему требует тебя наказать. Господь! Просвещение мое и спаситель мой, 
Кого убоюсь? Ну смотри у меня. Я рассчитаю с тобой проказник. Господи, бзда моя. So you wanted the oh yeah, because the liturgy scene is right after this, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, right there. I want I want so I'm really interested to see Father Nix's opinion on the liturgy scene. So you've been talking okay. about this scene for months. Yeah, because I have my own perspective on it. I want I want to see what your thoughts are. Okay. Mm -hmm. They not afford to put actual intents in the sensor. <laughs> Might have been setting off fire alarms in the studio. <laughs> True. Snitch. <laughs> Snitches get stitches. But he goes right back to it, facing the wrong way. <laughs> So okay, so yeah, so the 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 log with the char like the charcoal log that he threw down at the floor was a premonition of the fire that was about to engulf the abbot's home. Um, right. But but the liturgy thing, I I had something stuck out to me. What what? It, why do you think he was doing that? Mm, I think you should give your answer. Okay, so I it to me it was like. He, I think he was doing specifically for the prideful brother, knowing he would snitch on him. Mm. Also knowing that his eyes, the prideful brother's eyes are on him the whole time. Not and on it, the Lord. Not on the Lord. And it reminded me of me at mass so many times when there would be a, a parents with like older kids who should know better and behave. And the kids are playing around making noise and the parents don't say anything. And my mind is just like these freaking parents. Like it's one thing if you got an infant and the infant's crying. It's another thing, even a toddler, if the toddler's restless. But when you got an eight or a nine, you're getting into co-sleeping territory. I know, but oh you got an eight or nine year old no. and he's playing with his sibling, making noise, distracting everybody. And it just made me realize like how often my heart has judged those people instead of just not like just focus on the Lord. And especially because how often you see how often do I uh, you know, somebody's wearing something they shouldn't be wearing at mass. I'll judge that. I'll judge. There's so many times I'm at mass, and I, especially if I get stuck in a novus ordo, where my whole mind is just focused on all those terrible things going on instead of actually being present in the mass. And that's kind of what it seemed like was going on in that scene. Yeah, I missed that about the other brother. That's a great insight. I think you got it right. I think I think the other brother is just not. He's just so worried about him. Like he's just, it's his whole focus is on him. And it's, it, it's, I really yeah, think the whole thing. movie, he, it, Anatoly has him in mind. His, like he really loves him. And the, and the other, yeah. and the prideful brother doesn't love Anatoly at first. And he keeps saying right. that, to, he keeps saying that to him. He says, well, why don't you love me? You love me, right? Don't you love me? And it's, it's, it, he does have that conversion of heart later on in the movie where he finally realizes, oh, man, I love him. Now, in case we don't, I, I think we'll probably see the scene, but the movie does say that he's facing that direction at that point in time because that mm. is the direction that that the, he knows that it's going to burn down. Oh, wow. The movie yeah, says so. Read what Caitlin Smith said there. He knows the house is burning and he's letting his superior you know by bowing in, the, in that direction. I think that's the right answer. I missed that. Wow. Thanks, Caitlin. It's a great insight. It says that in the movie? No, that's what Caitlin said. It does say that the uh, oh. Philaret um, realizes this later as he's talking with Anatoly, and he brings it up. If you play, just play the rest of that clip. Remember, he, he, he criticized him. He's like, I, I don't 
I don't know how to read your prophetic games or something like that. Like he realizes he was acting that out to save the monastery. And he's like, I'm yeah. a simple man. I don't get this. You have to tell me something yeah. like that. That I'd like I, to see him say that. I think it might. I think it's right here. He says. Yeah, that's right. Right here. Except he's walking in a different direction of the window than the fire. I don't know. Ты ведь знал о пожаре проказник. Сего никто не ведает, только мы един Бог. Помнишь, главный мне под ноги бросил. Я ведь не забыл. Многие скорби праведным, отец человек. Что ж ты прямо не сказал? А главнями в меня швыряться начал. А я человек простой. Мне твои знаки непонятны. Если злословят вас за имя Христова, Дух Божий почерет на вас. Не увиливай, отвечай. Я все-таки твой начальник. Блаженны вы, когда будут гнать и поносить вас и всячески неправедно злословить за имя мое. Ой, замолчи, замолчи, замолчи. Да не зайдет солнце в гневе ваш. See, I'm not, I'm not so sure, Rob, because, because later on in the scene that I picked, the, the fire scene, he asks him again, he goes, what is it about in the, in the divine liturgy? Like when we're doing the liturgy, why do you not follow the rules? Because... If everybody just does whatever they want, it's madness and it's chaos. So I don't mm -hmm. think that's what was going on there. I really do think he's doing that to feign insanity, to to call his other brothers to something. Mm. Like he's trying to point something out to his other brothers. And I think it really is the prideful brother that, he's, that he cares so much about. The whole movie seems to be like him really trying to, uh, to save mentor that. mentor the younger one. Yeah, like he's trying to he's trying to save him throughout the whole film. Mm -hmm. I have one liturgical thought on a kind of a different topic. So I love the Eastern divine liturgies almost as much as the traditional Latin mass. Um, but what and so they're very majestic. But one interesting thing, and this is more a, a criticism of practice than the actual divine liturgy. But the Eastern churches, lay people are pretty sloppy about when they show up. They kind of wander in because there's not exact, you know, the Roman liturgy is pretty distinct when solemn high mass starts or low mass starts where like mm -hmm. you have really delineated parts where the priest has all these opening prayers in the divine liturgy and so people can kind of come in at this time or that and so because it's kind of this eastern mysticism without the perfectly uh you know 90 degree angles of, of roman catholicism people kind of wander into divine liturgy five minutes late 10 minutes oh, late 15 minutes late that. Yeah, I mean, you'll have like Greek babushkas making dumplings in the basement. I think they've considered themselves attending divine <laughs> liturgy if they're in the basement. Wow, okay, I didn't you know, know that. Yeah, so. It's okay at the Novus Ordo. You got women in the back making donuts and they think they're there too. Yeah, so. and so it's, there's, a, there's, and there's a little bit of sloppiness. Um, <laughs> SSPX priest will roast you if you're late. <laughs> there's a little bit of sloppiness. Um, and I, I want any Orthodox and Eastern Catholics to hear that I really love the divine liturgy, but they'll be the first to admit <laughs> Um, the practice of when normal people show up. You even see this in Eastern Catholic divine liturgies. People uh, all kind of wander in. And part of it's because if you got five or ten kids and it's an hour and a half, you know, there's a little flex room, I guess. They see they see things as flex room more than the us rigid Roman and Westerners. I, I was going to say, I think a lot of it is just the the difference between the Greek and, and Latin minds. Yeah. And, you know, the you, Greek... You can you see that even in the way they do confession, like they've they uh, the the conversations I've had with the with the Orthodox about confession, like they, I love the Latin way of confessing. I love that when we get a mortal sin, we go and confess the mortal sin. They they view that they like I've heard them say, "What what is this a McDonald's drive through? Like you got to go in and get?" Because I I critique the person who goes to, before the you know before the the vigil mass. They they give you that forty five minutes in the Novus Ordo of of confession and somebody will be in there for 15 20 minutes and it's like there's 30 people out here that want to go to confession like <laughs> if you want to do that that's fine but make an appointment like you, you can't spend 20 minutes when there's 30 people that want to go to confession it's just go pay fair. for therapy yeah <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah it's <laughs> confession especially before the before mass on a, on a saturday and you're only getting that hour it should be a quick thing if you there are some people who need uh, you know, they need spiritual direction or they need to go and uh, do like, you know, give a 
a, a general confession, something like that, you make an appointment for something like that. Sure. So, but whenever I've said that, the Orthodox jump on me. They're like, "What well, confession isn't like that?" Like they don't, they don't view mortal sin the same way we do. It's a very Latin way of thinking of it. You know, the it's, it, it's. I, I just know I I don't I don't want to speak for them because but that, that's yeah. the sense I've gotten when I've when I've interacted with them about it. I mean, First John five includes deadly sin and non-deadly sin. So I don't think most Orthodox would deny that there has to be a gradation of sin since it's right in the Bible. No, yeah, yeah. Seriously Orthodox. But you're right. They do have a, I think they have a pretty valid criticism of us hopscotching in and out of grace in the West. That's a valid criticism. You know, Yeah. sleep with your girlfriend Friday, go to confession on Saturday so you can receive communion on Sunday. That's not a patristic outlook on repentance mm -hmm. at all. Yeah, and I do, and I think, oh man, because you. I get mean, but Ligori, Ligori would be against that. I mean, Saint Alphonsus Ligori apparently said, if someone confesses the same mortal sin three times in a year, you deny him absolution. That's sort of a a more negative view, but but that kind of lines up with the Eastern Orthodox view of you just you're just saying that they see you can't misuse confession, and it's a pretty serious event. Oh, yeah, because you're getting into sin of presumption, but you're yeah. also you're also re not realizing that Ligori would have had his um his spiritual children at his parish where now it's the way it is now especially because of yeah. the automobile you like i some I, i'll go to a different priest every time i go to him i don't have a regular confessor so that mm -hmm. he would know mm -hmm. okay this is something you're struggling with this is the third time you've done this this year it's it's a very different situation now that we parish hop in the modern world you know i'm i'm I, like i go to mass 45 minutes away i go to confession 10 minutes away i'm not going to yeah. drive to my parish that that's 45 minutes away to go to confession. So I'll just go on a Saturday afternoon before the five o'clock mass. I'll go to confession. Then I'll go to mass on Sunday and drive an hour to go to mass on Sunday. So, you know, there's an element. And you know, this, this is an inch. So probably most of the listeners know this, but uh, Eastern monks and bishops are celibate, but most of their parish priests are married. Mary. And yeah. one of the, uh, I mean, I don't think that's apostolic in origin. I'll be really clear. I'm, I'm quite against that, but, one of the few advantages of that is when you have all these little parishes, your priest really knows you by now. At least this is how the East says. I mean, we're going to see if you know who in the Vatican allows married priests, it's just going to tank vocations more. So I'm not implying it brings more vocations. But if you're talking like rural Greece or rural Russia or rural Turkey, you would have all these like little parishes, these little Eastern Orthodox churches peppered through the land with a married priest there. And so you never had these like giant mega churches that you see in the suburbs of Atlanta or Denver, or Los Angeles. And so one advantage of this is they knew their people to the point that get this, even many Eastern Orthodox churches today, you have to present a little piece of paper during the great fast that we call Lent in the West. You have to present a little piece of paper that you went to confession to receive Holy Communion in Pascha in Easter. Or if you travel, you'll even see this probably like Rokor. Rokor is like the SSPX version of um, Eastern Orthodox parishes. Yeah. If you're Rokor, I would imagine, I don't know this for sure, but you probably have to have your little paper from your pastor if you travel to say, I'm a parishioner in good standing of the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, or just I'm an Orthodox. You have to have that if you're going to receive communion in another person's, um, another oh, wow. pastor's church. Yeah, so they're... There, there's none of this parish hopping and hopscotching in and out of this confessional or that, going to communion haphazardly. They had papers that you had to actually show that you were in good standing and frequently frequenting the sacraments if you ever traveled. I, I had the um, the married priest conversation with Calvin Robinson um, because I do think there is, like if they had a, a, a small avenue for a married priesthood i'm not against that in theory i'm against that because it would be just like communion in the hand and it would become the norm and it would be widespread and it wouldn't prevent anything because if you look like it's, it's not going to prevent right. homosexuality Scandal. or anything like if nope. you look at the anglican church they have married priests and they're the gayest church there is so but i wouldn't be in principle against a small contingent of married priests in the latin church it's just 
everything like everything else since the council it would be abused to yeah. the point where it would almost do away with priestly celibacy. Well, and we already have it. I mean, anyone that's come over from Episcopalian or into the Anglican ordinary or Eastern Orthodox priest that became Eastern Catholic. I mean, we actually already every probably 95 percent of the diocese of the United States have at least one married Catholic Western priest. And and probably many have Eastern like married priests. But you're right. That's a great example is, um, you know, hard cases make bad law. And yeah. we know what would happen in the West with that. Yeah, they abuse court. everything. There's yeah. there's no there's nothing there's no time where they give an exception where it doesn't become the rule eventually. Yeah. So, and it's also um, important to realize that anyone I mean, celibacy means you actually can control your libido. So it's not like we would have less priests molesting children if we allowed that. Because yeah. I mean, look at how it many happens teachers yeah, and uh, exactly. protestants it's, it's i mean the proverbial uncle in like every family who everyone is worried or i shouldn't say the proverbial in every family but like you know when yeah, you know, yeah. people talk about when there was abuse you'll hear the word uncle a lot more than priest right so the the notion that getting rid of celibacy will reduce the priest child scandals is bananas there's just no yeah there's no statistical proof that would help nah, none at all so um all right is my seat my is the main scene next rob do you yeah with the the blanket and yeah and so stuff. i tried to clip it as much as i could it's just such a long scene so i didn't even get the beginning where they're just chit-chatting and so so the abbey uh the abbot comes there and he's because he recognizes the holiness of anatoly and he's like I have been yeah. too comfortable for too long. I want to live with you and I, I want to learn from you. And he comes in, he goes, well, where, where do you sleep? He goes right here on the coals. He goes on the coals. He goes, yeah, right here on the coals, make yourself comfortable. So I think that's about where I, where I picked yeah. up. Только в них и могу ходить. Владык подарил по доброте душевной. Значит, у меня ноги-то больные. А одеял-то еще лучше. Это тоже Владыка? Нет, это я в Греции купил. Когда с митрополитом на Афон ездил. Ну ладно. Давай спать. This is crazy. <laughs> he locks him in like this. I almost picked this scene. <laughs> It's my it's my favorite scene in the movie. Uh, the first time I watched it, it brought me to tears. А что это ты делаешь, отец Анатолий? Читаю книгу грехов человеческих. Сейчас дочитаю в печку ее. И не греха. Ты что ты творишь, окаянный? Собираюсь теперь вторую страницу читать. To read the second page. Какая же эта страница? Какая это сапоги мои? Другого нету. Все. Ты что, не знал, что на голенищах архиерейских сапог больше всего грехов-то умещается? Что ты гороховый? заперто 
Сейчас весов гонять будем. А каких еще весов? Как каких? Видишь, сюда они проклятые. Ну, открой немедля. Сейчас. Мы... Открой. Иди, отец, покажи. Эх, Ну что смотришь? Страшное. Такое и есть. А я ведь, брат, на тебя и не сержусь. Я, брат, тебе наоборот благодарен. Да, благодарен, что избавил ты меня от всего лишнего на нас снова. А я ведь и правда. Привязан был и к этим сапогам, и одеялу, а ты меня от них избавил. Спасибо тебе. А главное, показал ты мне, что веру по мне мало. Я ведь по-настоящему испугался. Ой, уморит он меня в своей кочегарке. Ой, уморит. Смерти испугался маловерды. Не готов, значит, я к встрече с Господом нашим. They were like a source of pride for him, and they were demons that were that were uh, luring him away from God. And you think about all the comforts we have in our life, man. I'm like, when I watched this scene, I was just like, holy cow, all the things that I put in my life that I hold that I have like such a high, I put a high value on that they really are meaningless. They're just these material things that really should mean nothing. And If you were going to meet, like he he thought he was going to die and he was terrified because he was afraid to meet his maker because of the sins that were still in his heart. I thought I thought that was such a powerful scene. Yeah, beautiful scene. What do you think, uh, Rob? Uh <clears throat> I mean, yeah, the Anthony basically said it that that uh 
to this this monk, this abbot, um, who's you know, I don't know exactly if they take the same vows uh, in Orthodoxy, but you know, if, if he had been a, a Catholic monk, he would have taken a vow of poverty, and and I'm sure for the most part, he really had only a few possessions, but even having just those few possessions, he was attached to them in a way that that stood between him and god and it took something that drastic to show him that yeah it's like if, if he would have just tried to point out to him and tell him you're too attached to your boots you're too attached to your blanket he would have not he wouldn't have seen it him feigning this insanity like i'm so mm -hmm. glad that you really gave us the understanding of what a holy fool is because him feigning this insanity and and putting this big theatrical thing on it made him think really deep about what these things meant to him and how attached he was to them, you know? And it, it's, you, you think about all the things we're attached to, man. Oh, I scary. mean, everything in my bookcase behind me, I have up there because I, I love it and I'm attached to it in some way. Right. Like, yeah. So or any like, of those standing between me and God. Well, it's, it would be like, if you lost them all, how would you react right i think that's what it comes down to it's like mm. the, like okay you you could because as catholics like we're allowed to enjoy things right like God, like we're not uh i mean they're monks right so they're supposed to be living an ascetic life we're, but we're we're, we're not, not uh gnostic dualists that or cathars that that uh, well, think right. the material world is inherently is evil, evil right yeah so it's like we're allowed to have some good things and you know i struggle with this a lot as a father like how much do you give your kids? Like I'm taking my kids, I'm taking my kids snowboarding in a few weeks. We're going on vacation. Like we're, sp I'm spoiling my kids with these things. And, and I, I justify it in my head because I'm like, okay, this is really good family time that I'll get to spend with them. And these are memories I want to give my kids, but man, <laughs> man, I'm attached to my things. <laughs> and so remember the second half of that definition of a holy fool is one who mocks the world. And sometimes it can be an attachment to spiritual things, too, that the holy fool gets you detached from. So, for example, one of our holy fools in the West is St. Philip Neri. I think I got this story right. There was a Polish prince who heard of this saint in Rome, who is his great confessor, namely St. Philip. So he came all the way from Poland to this great confessor, presumably to have like a great story that he went to this, you know, intense confessor maybe got a hair shirt or something like that as a penance because he hears that this is this super holy priest so there's apparently some spiritual pride he goes to saint philip neri and his penance philip neri gives him his little dog and makes him take his dog down to one of the fountains in the plaza in his place in rome and he has to give his dog a bath he has to wash his dog as a yeah. penance totally not like the glorious you know, whip yourself in yes. public <laughs> yeah. thing that he wanted. He had to go wash his dog, right? And so sometimes the thing the holy fool detaches you from is your spiritual pride when you thought it was going to be <laughs> something materialistic. Yeah. Yeah, you think even even what Edie's saying, she's like, like if, if our favorite item was ruined, we'd be furious and angry. And the abbot yeah. was grateful. That's the thing. Like everything, yeah. everything that Anatoly does he's not just doing to point out the person's sin. He's doing it because he knows it will lead to an act of repentance. He's That's doing right. it. And it, and it's very similar to the Padre Pio scenes that we were, that we love so much. Right. So in the confessional, when he was a little harsh with somebody, he wasn't harsh for the sake of being harsh and just trying to be mean to somebody. He had these deep spiritual insights where he was able to know exactly what that person needed to hear, exactly what that person needed to see in that moment. And, and you can see that's what's going on in this scene. And see, that's why another one of our holy fools in the West is St. Francis of Assisi. And that's why on this show, I hope we never do Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, because he's he's portrayed as a holy fool with no purpose. He's just a hippie, right? There's really no purpose behind it, except maybe union with nature or something like that. So you make a great point, Anthony, that there's there's a purpose of the gospel, repent and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ and be saved in all of his actions. And that's yeah. what's so key that we have to understand with the holy fools is, is they're not acting as clowns for Christ to bring them attention or to show the gospel is not something to be serious or they're just hippies or they're just schizophrenics. There's a purpose behind their actions um, to detach not only others, but even themselves 
so that nobody thinks they're such great people. Yeah, it's like it, it, it's always with this, uh, with the other's soul in mind. It's it's really, it's it's these amazing spiritual insights that God gives to certain saints, man. It's 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 pretty wild. Well, like St. Philip Neri shaving just half of his beard. That was so n to detach his own soul from admiration of people. Yeah. So they thought he was crazy. So do, what, what scenes do we have left? I have two at the, my last, the last two scenes are the last two scenes of the movie that I picked. So the last two I picked are the last two scenes. And so it's the exorcism scene and the confession scene. And by confession scene, I mean the mutual confession scene between Tikon and Anatoly. Um, okay. So, so then I want to watch the scene after that between the prideful brother and Anatoly right before he dies with the coffin. Okay. I, I want to show everybody. The we're at hour 30, so we better move quick on those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So let's go to the, yeah, let's go to the yeah, exorcism, exorcism first and then confessions, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. And let me, um, there's one thing I want to say in the exorcism scene. If you look at someone like St. Catherine of Siena, probably a lot of our listeners know this, but you know, in the 13th century, there's people in Europe that exorcists couldn't free from these demons and just being in her presence due to holiness the demons left. So this notion, the reason I really love this exorcism scene is just his prayers without him. I, I don't like all these exorcism movies where priests are screaming and nuns are screaming. And yeah. I mean, in real life, there can be manifestations in the person who's possessed where that person screams, but you're never really going to see priests screaming and the people who are in there helping screaming and nuns falling downstairs. I mean, all this idea in the modern movies that it's like a fair fight between God and Satan is yeah. totally a satanic. It's not a fair fight between God and Satan. God created Satan. So this notion that an exorcism has to be, um, you know, with priests expending all this energy, I mean, I'm sure it's sure it's tiring. I'm not an exorcist, <laughs> but no, but you're I, right. why, why I love this scene. Yeah. The why I love theatrics this scene. From the theatrics just, is ridiculous. Yeah where there's numerous saints who just their prayers could free somebody. And that's why I think this is really accurate. Okay. okay ready? Yep. So this is Tikon's daughter who he shows up. With. He's a communist. He thinks she's sick. He doesn't realize that she's possessed. And he certainly doesn't know that the skipper that or the the boiler room man that shot him is on this island, and is a miracle worker. And, and it's a a big deal, pol kind of geopolitically that yeah that he's willing to do this because he's an an admiral in the mm -hmm. Russian Navy. Like they're all um, scrutinized very closely for the, you know the political allegiance of the Communist Party, yeah. and the Communist Party would have never allowed something like this. Going to a monk's island, you mean? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Their yeah, head's not spinning. His head's not spinning. It. <laughs> Say, like in The Exorcist, the head spins around and she stabs herself with the crucifix. No, I mean, exorcists really do see that type of stuff, yeah. but it's in the anergamon, not the priest. Fuck <laughs> Боже, помоги нам немощным. Аминь. Rob, let this whole clip roll if you could, because I, I ended it at the at an important spot.
Теперь все хорошо. Поплачь, поплачь. Ничего, поплачь. Yeah, that that I love that scene. It, it's, um, but also when, when we're setting up the next one, um, the the torment throughout this whole movie, um, is Father Anatoly is dealing with this deep shame for the acts he committed in the in the beginning scene, right? That he that he killed his friend Tikov, and he's almost at a point of despair where he's worried he won't be forgiven, and. It's this amazing grace that happens to him that God gives him this amazing grace. Like even even allowing even allowing her to get possessed, God had Anatoly in mind, right? Yeah, like yeah. like even allowing he had her this... in mind and Tikon in mind and Father Anatoly in mind. And it's like the, the whole thing really comes together like that, where it's like even her possession is not just incidental or accidental. It has it has the purpose of bringing. Um, Anatoly of this burden that's on his soul. Exactly. Um, all right, so let's get to that last scene because we also have to figure out what movie we're watching next. Yeah. That's okay, true. So, we haven't decided that. Um, did you have one? I the last one I have is the and remember the opening scene was the boiler room man who becomes Anatoly, shoots the captain, turns out he didn't kill him, shot him in the shoulder, he fell over, and then um, he brings his daughter. Anatoly gets to redeem himself by freeing the possessed daughter of the man he shot but didn't kill. And now we're going to – and actually you said something, Anthony, that I didn't put together. He can't quite give her that hump that he's going to be forgiven by God. And God uses Tikhon's forgiveness of him to get over that hump that he yep. could ever be forgiven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So it's like – so for, if for anybody that didn't watch the movie, what we're talking about – so the guy he shot at the beginning – winds up living and that girl that just had the the possession is the daughter of the guy he shot at the beginning of the movie so now the guy doesn't know he's coming to see anatoly he doesn't know that's who shot him or anything so he just hears there's this holy monk on this island so he goes to bring his daughter to this holy monk and it turns out this is how this is really the setup for this scene. and like rob pointed out i mean this was a last ditch effort i mean he doesn't even believe in this stuff but it's just like Maybe, you know, this was a last job because no physician or psychologist in Moscow or St. Petersburg or anywhere could heal her. Um, no, Vincent Amusa says, does Anatoly really not believe he could be forgiven? No, I think he does believe he could be forgiven. He does the Jesus prayer. He seems to have that. I mean, every monk prays the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So you're right. I take it's that It's not back. despair. I, it's, not, not despair, it's not despair. It's something else because... Yeah, I, I take that back. It wasn't despair. It's not Thanks despair because that. father, father, his father superior, you know, the abbot mm -hmm. talks to him about that earlier in, in another scene where he says to him, don't despair. Like, you know, God is merciful. You know, God is merciful. Yeah. But it's still this grace that God gives him before he goes and meets him. Like, rest at ease, my child. You know? I just think at the human level, like theology aside and the ascetical, I hate saying that, put theology aside because that's everything. But like, the man you thought you killed, you didn't kill. There's a huge psychological relief yeah. in that. Yeah. Um, yeah I kind of have a life. two questions on kind of moral theology, Father. Um, one, say Tikhon did actually die. Mm -hmm. Would Anatoly have been guilty of a mortal sin of murder for that? Because what, like, Was he coerced enough where it wasn't fully a free mm -hmm. will? And then on the flip side, Tikhon didn't really die, but if he had been guilty of murder, if Tikhon died, is he actually still kind of guilty of the sin of murder? Because he intended it. Yeah, so for the for the first one, um, the reason I'd say yes, he's still guilty is because we see 
man can resist. And the easiest proof of that is the captain who lights up a cigarette. Like, would he, would the captain have shot Tikon, or would the, would the captain have shot his boiler room man in the face of those Germans? No, even and he's probably an atheist. So that's where we can't really get into like full knowledge and full consent of the will. Right. If if simply a good atheist communist wouldn't shoot another then there's at least a natural grace, even if it's not a supernatural grace, to avoid that, meaning it's some can, form of sin. Can cowardice be a mortal sin, you think? I, I think St. Thomas Aquinas answers that in the Summa, but I don't know the answer. because yeah, It's, has, like, like, it's a, almost like a sin of omission or something could mm-hmm. be a mortal sin, right? A sin of I mean, omission. denying, yeah, denying the faith. I mean, I read the Roman Martyrology every day, and they were torturing this one early Christian and it said he was at the point of apostatizing. And that's just amazing to me that they would they would consider denying Christ under torture to be apostasy. I mean, really you can make that argument from the gospels, but the fact that it's in the Roman martyrology shows that we don't get this whole pass of reduced culpability as much as modernist theology makes it out to be. You know? Yeah, it's it's like um even even when they they play around with this whole idea of of Judas not being in hell, what the modernists always do, right? They're like, well, well, you know, Judas did feel like so. Judas had almost repented, right? But when he goes and gives the money back, like he almost repent, like he like he's at that point, mm-hmm. but he despairs and takes his own life. Like he doesn't actually repent. He doesn't trust that. Jesus can forgive him. He just total despair in that. Where Peter also denies Christ, right? He doesn't he doesn't betray him on the same level, but he does betray Christ. Three times he denies him, but he's he goes to Christ and 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 repents. And it's it, it's just that that little bit of a difference that could mean the difference in heaven or hell. Yeah. And then for your second question, Rob, it seems that St. Thomas Aquinas says an attempted sin that is not completed due to something in the circumstances of divine pro- uh, providence, he does seem to say there's some mitigation of the gravity mm. of that. And even though St. Thomas Aquinas chalks that up to providence more than success, somehow there seems to be some mitigation of gravity. So like, for example, if if you're traveling alone in some city in Europe and you have a w- moment of weakness and you grab a hundred euros from your pocket and you're going to go pay some prostitute, and then she looks at you and says, you're too ugly and that's not enough money. Yeah. Then you know that's there's some mitigation. Of, I was gonna say I was gonna say something along the lines of like you're you're looking on the internet and your internet connection goes out before you like get that. to look at the image. Like exactly. you already made the choice to do it. Yeah. But the mitigating or, or like back in the day with the dial up, if someone had picked up the phone or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like, so I think you should still confess it, but there's some mitigation of the gravity of a sin according to St. Thomas Aquinas. Okay. All right, let's get that last scene and then we have to talk about what movie we're yep. watching next. Да ты не бойся, адмирал. У меня же здесь не проверка, не первый отдел. Да я, собственно, никого не боюсь. Я свое отбоялся. Я действительно не понимаю, зачем я вам нужен. В сорок втором в плен я попал. Пацан совсем. Немцы мне жизнь предложили в обмен, чтобы я своего товарища расстрелял. А где вы служили? Здесь и служил. На Северном флоте. И как того товарища звали? А я не помню. Старше он меня был, шкипер вроде, буксир водил. Ну что ж ты меня не спрашиваешь? Расстрелял я его. Ну и расстрелял ты его? Расстрелял. И как мне с этим жить, я не знаю. Я не знаю. 
А зачем ты мне об этом рассказываешь? Да старый С такими грехами помирать страшно. Боюсь. Ты не бойся. Помирай спокойно, батюшка. Знал я того моряка. Живой он оказался. Ты тогда только руку ему прострелил. Взрыв случился, он за борт упал и за доску схватился. А на утро там его свои нашли. Прости за меня. Прости за все. А? Давно простил. Я же думал, что тебя и в живых нет. Думал, ты тогда вместе с Бажей там. Тихон. Иди с миром. Господь с тобой. Yeah, what an awesome scene, man. Yeah, Just it's like good. it's like the whole thing came full circle. God gives him this beautiful grace at the end to know that not only is he forgiven by God, but he's forgiven by the man who he committed the act against. And he was able to do this act of of charity for the man that he did that to and healed his daughter like that. And, he, and, and the thing is, God really does work like that, where he'll bring a situation in your life full circle like that to, you know, it's, it's amazing when he does that in your life. That's kind of cool. Our, our podcast here, we have a priest and two laymen and uh, we've all helped each other out in real life. And, you know, it's just cool how you have all these different vocations that get tied together um, in uh in the catholic life in the orthodox life as yeah. you see in that um i love how in that scene we just saw they switch from third person to second person <laughs> only in the very end of it yeah you know, yeah he goes about, talking about yeah well i know that person he he lives you know and it's like yeah. i'm sorry t god i'm sorry <laughs> and how do you have this admiral in the communist navy say and he meant it, you could tell he meant it so i don't mean this as a as if he were lying um How does an admiral in the communist navy in the 1980s say, I forgave you a long time ago? And that just shows some tremendous natural virtue. Once again, if, even if there's not supernatural virtue, yeah. that level of natural virtue whew, just blows me away. Yeah, because forgiveness is one of those things where if you if you harbor resentment yeah. towards somebody, you're it's, it's one of those weird things. It's like uh, envy is like that where you're you if you have envy of something somebody like it's it, so jealousy would be like i want what you have which isn't always bad you know like to to want what somebody has if they have something good you could be jealous and envy is i don't want that person to have it right you know and it's like yeah. when you feel like that towards somebody you think you're punishing the person but you're actually it's just internal torment yeah. and you're ripping your own soul That's apart. right you just hurt yourself Yeah, so for even for him to forgive uh, uh, Anatoly like that, you know, <laughs> forgive your enemies, guys. God, Jesus didn't tell us that just uh, for no reason. He, he, he tells us that for our own good. Yeah. So, Rob, um, what's, what's Rob's final thoughts on the movie before we talk about uh, next movie? Well, I, did you want to play the oh, you had last scene, scene with Father Joe? Well, I, I don't, I don't, it's a pretty long scene. So, I, you is. know what? We'll leave something for yeah, the let's people. Do it. To go. All right, let's go do it. Yeah. bring it up. So, okay. I want to go to where he builds the coffin for him. Oh, yeah. That's where he gives him the coffin. At the where he gives end. him the coffin he built. Okay, give me a second. I'm just. Yeah, because this scene, it kind of shows the whole. Um, it's another whole forgiveness thing comes one, full, really. It comes full circle between him and the prideful brother. Yeah. And. It's it, it's yeah, all right. 
It reminds Phil of the ending to Rocky Four. <laughs> so I see people arguing with Phil in the comments. Don't take Phil seriously. Don't guys. take anything Phil says seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Phil is hilarious. Доброе работа. Мы его сначала шкуркой, потом лаком сверху прошлись. Гарнитур. Хоть в гостиную вместо буфет ставь. А, нравится. Ну что ж ты наделал? Мне же гроб нужен, а не буфет. Я для тебя стараюсь. Хотел как лучше. А тебе все не нравится. Ну, хочешь, давай я наждак принесу эту в раз с дерем или этим углем твоим вымужем. Ты мне скажи, что ты хочешь. Я все для тебя сделаю, отец Анатолий. Слушай, батюшка, отец его, прости ты меня, дурака старого, а? Ну и за сажу эту прости, ты... и за Каина, и за буфет этот, Господь с ним. Ладно, ладно. Прости, ты старать. Не, не будем старать вспоминать, и, и, и ты, меня, ты меня прости. Несправедлив я к тебе. И ты меня прости, Христора. Прости, отец. Ну и Бог простит. Да. Слава тебе, Господи. А вот, а вот, смотри, давай, давай вот я угля возьму и вот, смотри. Смотри, как получается. Смотри, сначала в раз чистим эту всю. Смотри, как ты, как ты хочешь, смотри. Отец Анатолий, отец Анатолий. Все, помоги. It's wild that he knows exactly when he's about. Like he, he's, he's able to decide. Okay, now it's time for me to leave the earth, Father. Into your hands I commend my spirit. You know, mm -hmm. he's able to to do everything he has to do at the end and just close his eyes and leave peacefully like this. So I mean, you can end the clip. Oh, I just wanted to show. Just the, the prideful brother who had such a hard time with him the whole movie finally really does see the love that he's getting from Anatoly. Like he's he understands what he's doing for him, and he finally comes around and just all he wants is his approval at that point. He's just like, please come on, just let me do something for you. I just want your approval now. And and the act of both of them begging one another's forgiveness at the end was just a powerful scene. And actually, when he takes the charcoal and starts scraping it, that's I think that's when he changed. That's when it's all love. You know, Russians can scream, and it's an act of love. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember the uh, that Simpsons episode where there's these two Russians in like outside Central Park playing chess, and they're screaming at each other back and forth. And then the subtitles are like, "That was a good move. It's your turn now." <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, well, we, we what, Westerners are afraid of people yelling at each other, but you could tell they're screaming at each other was was screaming in charity, actually. Yeah. Well, one thing my one of my high school Russian teachers told us is, never ask a Russian how they're doing, or how their day's going, because they will tell you. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. they they are oh, wow. brutally honest all the time. It's it's just who they are what would possess cool. you to that. take six years of Russian, man? <laughs> it was better than French or Spanish. Really. In my in, in my opinion, yeah. I think it's kind of a beautiful language. Yeah, I took Italian. Obviously, yeah, that's my. Plus, it, it was a I language. Think that is the most beautiful. I hate saying this to an Italian, but I do think that is the most <laughs> beautiful language on the planet. Russian was yeah, a language Russian. literally invented by two saints. So, mm. Cyril and Methodius. Oh, really? Yep. I didn't know that. Um. Oh, well, Hope is in here. So How's the she, airport. <laughs> she actually liked the the movie so much that she wanted to watch the show. Wow, I I haven't seen Hope in a while. I hear Hope's uh, in a, on a layover, and her so Hope was going to Florida to see um her family, 
And when she had the she had a layover in Chicago, and she gets to Chicago, and Air Force One comes in. No, no the Air Force oh, One came into our little airport in Duluth, up here in oh, Minnesota. Wow. She texts me. She's like, apparently my flight's being delayed. Five minutes later, I think I just saw Air Force One. Five minutes later, <laughs> my flight's delayed because of Air Force One. Oh I, man, I so. messes everything up. Yes. <laughs> so she's actually stuck in Chicago because of Joe Biden. Overnight. Like, oh. <laughs> And I'm in Florida. He, he, he. I so think I think it's funny. So my wife, Hope, grew up Protestant. She took Latin, whereas me, the Catholic, took Russian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is your wife, Hope Whiten. Yeah, that's my wife. Oh, yep. that's cool. Hi, Hope. I want, look forward to meeting you. Um. Okay, so what are some ideas for our next movie, guys? Can I narrow it down to two or at least two? Sure. Or most? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to propose either Alfred Hitchcock's I Confess since Anthony loves black and white movies <laughs> and or the mission with Jeremy Irons and Robert. DeMille. I mean, the mission is one of my favorite movies. I it, vote. I confess just because let's, then let's put it up then let's Hitchcock put it to the movie. live. Let's put it to the live chat. Let's look at the vote. All right. You guys get to this side. Put a poll up, Rob. Let's put a poll up. So now for future movies, though, let's just spitball here. So we, we're going to okay. do, I, we'll either do, we'll do these two movies in either order. We'll be the next two, right? Okay. Um, now you mentioned Brother, Son, Sister, Moon. I would say <laughs> if we're going to do something on St. Francis, there's a movie called Francesco right. uh, from 19, 1980, I think. And it has, um, oh man, what's his name? Uh, oh man, he was, he was in The Wrestler. You remember the movie The Wrestler? Mickey Rourke? Mickey Rourke mm. plays St. Francis. A young Mickey Rourke. He's like 20, <laughs> 21 years old. Apollo 13. <laughs> yeah. We've been uh, we've been discussing how we don't believe the moon landing happened lately. Oh, so it's funny. I'm actually on that. I'm with you on that. Um, okay, so Tom said he saw the mission in the movie theaters. Wow. Um I, I I love the mission. The mission is one of my favorite Catholic films, and it's not a Catholic film. It's just a, a secular film with Catholicism in it. Now it does have a little. I think that one will be interesting to discuss because it has a little liberation theology mixed right. in there. And there's a justification of abortion slash infanticide. Once, in yeah, that that might be one good for a conversation. But, I mean, and this this ties back into the criticism that we had of doing an Eastern Orthodox movie. Like, we're there's going to be problems in any mm -hmm. movie. We're, I, I mean until we have like Leo on to discuss Bella that was made by Catholics for Catholics. And I think he probably will join us. Maybe we can get Eduardo too. We're going to have, I oh, mean, that would be so cool if you could get them on with us. Leo, I was just talking to Leo a couple days ago. I think he joined us. Um, but anyway, point is, uh, I mean, unless traditional Catholics made the movie, we're going to have some problems in the movie. So what, this what's is, funny we, is we this don't movie had TLM less problems than our previous two. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, there was yeah, nothing. So, we but found. listen, the thing is, the problems make for good discussion. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. I mean, I'm pretty sure we're gonna hate, or I'm gonna hate Anthony's France Francesca movie. But that's okay. I, we can disagree can on stuff. But that's the point, that's, right? That's like, so, point. so look, I, Brother, Son, Sister Moon is unwatchable, right? But Francesco is. There's a few things that are problematic in it. But I think the the way they portray Francis, I think you're going to like. He's a very he's not he's nothing like a hippie. Okay, all right. He's not a hippie at all. He is gritty. Is that right? Oh, uh, I I think I think it's the only portrayal of Saint Francis that I mean, it, it, watching it actually changed my perception of the the hippie figure that they presented to me. Okay, good. You know, so it, I it, can't see the live chat from here. Is it more votes for the mission so, or? Uh... I confess has sixty eight percent of the vote. Okay, all right. You guys just want so to we'll, see me we'll, watch it. We'll, we'll do. I confess, mm -hmm. then the yeah. mission, and then can we do Beckett after that? Yeah, perfect. I've never seen Beckett. Beckett is one of my favorites. This is so cool because Maybe we, we do, have do a Beck lot of movies. Did you pick one yet, Rob? No. Well, then let's do Beckett after either next or after I confess. We can do it after I confess, and then we can <laughs> okay. do the mission. Okay, and then we'll I do the mission, Beckett and then. Mission. And then I think Francesco will do after that. Francesco. So, okay. is this true? Is Gibson on Stein show? Is he really? Wow, I don't That's know. Pretty huge, huh? Cool. That's pretty huge. Good for him. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, Beckett is a little historically off in terms of the, uh, the relations between the Anglo Saxons and the Normans, but oh, okay. Other than that, it's it's pretty good. So what's okay. what's exciting about I Confess is it's a whole movie about the seal of confession, and there's a few things that only a traditional priest will know that I'm excited to share um, with with people. I mean, there's a bunch of things in like Hitchcock on law and crime and stuff that only a lawyer will know. But there's a couple interesting things on the seal that somehow Hitchcock knew. Maybe every Catholic before Vatican II knew this, but it's really inside baseball on it. Um, so it's a murder mystery tied up with a sacramental mystery. One of my favorite movies. Um, I want to just address this real quick because th th typically these shows get around 3,000 views or something. I'm so excited that 3,000 people check these shows out because I have so much fun doing them. Like, there's so right. for, for people that, like, I don't, I don't think most people understand what we're doing here, right? Like, you're not just discussing the, the film. This episode, we mainly discussed the film, but like the last one, like, we wound up going off on some really interesting tangents where it was getting into current top, even this one we did, right? A little bit with fiducia supplicons and yeah. things like that. So, I mean, I hope more people catch on to it. I don't care if you guys have seen the movie or not. Think about what's out on Catholic YouTube. I mean, everybody's doing the same freaking thing on every channel. Yeah. Everybody's looking for the the story of the day to go and tackle it. We're just trying to discuss yeah. more, more uh, deeper themes. Um, we're trying to remind each other that it's like still joyful and fun to be Catholic. So you sit here and you discuss Catholic culture a little bit with mm -hmm. each other. And yep. I, I, I don't care if this drops down to 500 views. I like this series and I hope everybody else is enjoying it too. So yeah, it's fun. Yeah, I, really I think, it. I think, I think the people that know what we're doing here, will check out every episode, whether they like, if you don't have time to watch, I confess before the next time, still watch the show. Who cares? We'll play sure. the relevant clips. Yeah, you don't need to watch it. It's 90 minutes long, so you can it's find 90 one. minutes. That's the other thing. Like, we have a month to, to watch it before the next season. Uh, two minutes, the by the way. Two minutes. Okay, so. All right, so, so far, I most confess. of our reviews have been longer than the movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny, isn't it? Well, it's good to keep it in a tight two hours. Every one of them has gone two hours, so it's like. Yeah. It. it, it and it goes fast. Like you, you know, it's a good show when the time goes fast. I don't, I, I don't know how the heck two hours went by this quick. Everyone's doing the same thing. Says the man who dropped this very unique trivia show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh man! Um, all right, guys, we appreciate you. Fathers, anything you want to promote before we got uh, to get cut off here? Nope. Just um, this is fun. Watch. Uh, I confess, if you got a chance. Yeah, and obviously go check out Padre Peregrino on YouTube, oh, yeah, uh, Fathers on Telegram. Also, is your blog still going? You're still posting blog posts, right? Tw yep, twice a week and one podcast a week. And um, hopefully get some uh, good interviews um, this next year. I'm going to get you guys on too. But yeah. That'll be fun. Yeah, so there's a possibility we could get Eduardo uh, Vestuigi is his last name, right? Rastigi. I mean, I can definitely – I shouldn't say definitely. I should be able to get the producer – um, I don't know if Eduardo will join us, but those two are tight. I have Eduardo's phone number, but he rarely gets back to me. But Leo, he will get back to us. If we get them both for Bella, that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, I think so. So, all right, we got about 30 seconds left, guys. We will see you guys. Oh, so next week, Rob and I have uh, uh, Eric Ibarra and Nick Cavazos next week. So we'll see you guys next week. This awesome. was a fun week. We'll see you guys soon. Thanks, guys. God bless you.